Hey guys, what's up? Thank you so much for tuning in today here at Elevate Church. We know that today's message is going to rock your world and elevate your life to the next level. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the message. You know, it's the, it's the local church where you discover your purpose. I, I believe that. That's where I found my call. Um, it wasn't at work. It wasn't at my job. It wasn't in my career that I discovered what I was called to do. It was in the local church that I discovered my calling, where I discovered my purpose, where I discovered my identity. It's in the local church where I saw my children grow up in the things and the ways of God. My daughter is now 22. My son is 18. And let me tell you something, parents. I want to encourage you that you have a mandate, a mantle, an anointing to pass that gift, that talent, that calling over to your children, whatever it is it may be. Not everyone's called to full-time ministry, but let me tell you something. Some people are called to the work ministry, right? Some people are called to the entertainment ministry. Ministry. Some people are called to the church ministry, but all of us have been called to God's ministry, period. Every single one of you have been called to be ministers of God, and it's exciting to see how God is touching lives. And... Um, I, I pray and hope that today's message will stir something in your heart. I pray that there's going to be a holy conviction in your life as there is in my life right now as I was preparing for this message. There's an awakening happening. There's a wave happening right now in America f- for churches to wake up. When I say churches, I mean you, me, to wake up. There's a wave that God is bringing to, to, to not only raise up but also to push forward his his, his body, his kids. And I want to start with this first verse because this verse is something that's going to wake us up. Do not listen to me today with your typical ears. Don't listen to me today with your predictable listening or seeing. I want you to be unpredictable today. And I want you to pray this. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I pray that we would have ears to hear, eyes to see, and a heart to receive what you want to say today. Father, I, I release my religious ears right now. My religious eyes, my religious perspective, my religious attitude and ideas to see the truth because it's only the truth that can make me free. And so today, I declare freedom in Jesus' name. If you believe that, say amen. Amen. Okay, Luke chapter 1, look at this, verse 37. I want you to see this differently. Jesus himself is quoting this verse to you and I. Jesus is talking to his disciples, and he's trying to wake them up because they're just too sleepy. They're too sleepy. They're just too comfortable. They got in so comfortable with him. Be careful with the temptation to be comfortable with your God. Be careful with the temptation to be comfortable with your Christianity. Be careful to not get so comfortable with the temptation of just being an attender and not a follower. And so Jesus begins to describe his relationship between him and the Father. I know that we've read this verse many times, but think about this. He is basically expressing how him and God do life together. He's expressing to his disciples like, hey, this is how he and I connect on a daily basis. He's expressing to his disciples, please stop being so comfortable. Wake up. Snap out. Because this life will put you to sleep. This life will woo you to sleep. This life will put you to bed. Life will throw things at you. And sometimes you don't even have control over life. Okay? It happens. Sometimes life is like an avalanche. You never saw it coming. But Jesus is realizing that, hey, the church is too comfortable. So let me go ahead and give them my declaration of independence. Or dependent. He says... For with, everybody say with. with. Notice that it says for God. It says for with God. So underline with. Bring out your crayons today and color with, with, okay? Highlight it, underline it, scribble it, circle it. Do something with it, but make sure that you don't forget this word with. So Jesus is expressing this, 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 this 
idea that he had already been sharing that the disciples forgot. I mean, they're walking with the Messiah, the healer, the deliverer. And obviously, there's a disconnect. Maybe right now you're disconnected from your faith right now. Maybe you have more faith in your enemy than you have more faith in your God. Maybe you have more faith in your dysfunction than having more faith in the one who can restore you and make you whole again. And so he says, for with God, we can just close our books and go home right there. He says, for with God. With who? With who? With God. With God. That means that I have to be with God. With God. Nothing. Nada. You know what? I, I, went so, I, I went into like all the definitions of nothing, and it was profound. You know what it means? Nothing. <laughs> it's just nothing. For with God, nothing will be impossible. See, the reason we, you and I, we, because we is better than me. The reason we constantly face our challenges and struggles and, 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 and our delays, it's not because God is not showing up. It's just that we're not, please leave that up. It's just that we're not walking with God. See, the only one that can take what looks impossible to you and me, whatever it is, we all have something that looks impossible. But when you're with God, things start looking more possible. When you have lost touch with the faith that was placed in you, you are now walking with you and not with God. Because if you're walking with God, Jesus is reminding his disciples that anything or that nothing will be impossible for you and me. Nothing. When Is Jesus a liar? He is a liar? <laughs> no, he's not a liar. Oh, y'all stop it. Y'all just ain't listening. I pray for New Year's and look at you guys, man. <laughs> I should have prayed, Lord, clean their ears. <laughs> <laughs> Let me try this again. Is Jesus a liar? No. Okay. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Blame it on the pastor. Yeah, it's all my fault. Yeah. He's gone away for one week and now it's all his fault. Yeah, yeah. For with God, nothing will be impossible. For with God, nothing will be impossible. Say with me, for with God, nothing will be impossible. For with God, nothing will be impossible. For with God, nothing will be impossible. What are you facing right now that looks impossible? Because with God, this can be possible. For with God, nothing. Say that three times. Ready? One, two, three, go. For with God, nothing will be impossible. For with God, nothing Think about it. That is God's 4th of July declaration. He has his own declaration. He has his own independence. He says, hey, with me, nothing can be impossible. As I read these verses, I begin to think, oh, my God, God is taking this word nothing. And he starts saying, this ain't no thing. <laughs> right? Let's break up the word. No thing. Nothing. No. Th this ain't no thing. Listen, there is no thing too big for God. There is no thing too massive for God. There is no thing too great for God. There is no thing too impossible for God. It is impossible without God, but it's all possible with God. The question is, are you with God or are you with you? Do you put more faith in what you can do or do you put more faith in what he can do? With God, I walk with God, I talk with God, I pray to God. I read God, or God reads me. For with God, 
no thing will be impossible. You see, with God, there's no thing that, that can get in the way of reaching your children that are fr- probably far away from God right now. That's no thing for God. So, you know, Jesus is telling everybody, hey, with God, there's nothing, man. With me and him, there's nothing in public. He says, but then Jesus says, and then you know what? When you hang out with me, man, there, that ain't no thing. Sickness, no thing. Health issues, no thing. Financial pressures, no thing with God. He can help. You see, the closer we get to him, the closer we get to our breakthrough. With God, for with God, no thing, nothing. For example... I think many of us know Jesus as the healer only. But I want you to think about this. So Jesus is, he's walking, right? And Jairus comes to him and he says, "Uh, Master, uh, my daughter, 12 years old, she's sick and dying at home. Please, you know, can you come to my, he says, this is no thing. This is no thing. Let's go. He starts rolling over there to the 12-year-old girl. And what happens? As he's walking over there, somebody else comes to him that's sick distracts him and then now uh Jairus is just chilling there waiting like come on man dude hurry up dude man, you woman with the issue of blood just do your thing and go let's go he's freaked out because time he's freaked out because come on the clock is ticking I, I, I need I need to get to my daughter my daughter is sick and so Jesus is doing his thing and he's having a conversation Jairus probably like, dude, can you just leave your sermon for another day, bro? Just come. And so he shows up to the house, and one of the servants of Jairus comes. He says, hey, listen, don't bother the king. Don't bother Jesus. Don't bother anymore. Your daughter's dead. See, right now, maybe something is fresh in your life that is dead. I want you to know that when Jesus shows up in your life, Okay, whether there's something that's dead right now, that's present, maybe something happened very recently. When he shows up, he is not only healer, because once something's dead, it's dead. But Jesus is also the God who knows how to raise the dead man. He knows how to raise the dead. Maybe you're dead in passion right now. Maybe you're dead in dreams. You're dead. You're just dead. You're barely surviving. You're, you barely made it here. As a matter of fact, you were probably driving around in circles around New Hall just trying to find a parking spot. And you were at the last minute ready to give up and quit and say, you know what, I'll just come back next Wednesday. God is not just a God of healing. He is the God who knows how to take a man who is dead or a woman who is dead or a child who is dead, not just physically but spiritually, and he knows how to bring things back to life. When Jesus walks into a room, he will turn the tables and just check you up for good. The church is dead. In America, we're dead. We're very complacent. We're just very just kind of like nonchalant. It it needs to change. What is it that's dead in your life right now? Walk with God. For with God, nothing will be impossible. For with God, not the next time you look at your children, your spouse, your finances, you just look at that thing. You say, for with God, nothing will be impossible. You see, with you, yes, impossible. For with God. Nothing will be impossible. Man, God is just waiting for a people that would just have a faith to rise up and walk into a bad situation to say that, you know what, I hear what you're saying, but but with God, nothing will be impossible. This ain't no thank for God. Are you hearing me today, church? Please get where I'm coming from. You know, I I, I went whitewater rafting last week. I needed some time off. And, uh, you know, my wife and... Uh, my pastors, they got on the big boat, and, you know, I wanted to go a little cray cray. I said, no, I'll do the kayak. And, um, and it, but then I, then I got on, and then I got, like, nervous. I'm like, what if I fall off? And, and you know, be careful because when the thoughts come, help us, Jesus. Like, what if I flip over? What if I just stay stuck? What? Because, you know what, uh, I remember years ago I did a class uh, uh, four or five 
whitewater rafting. Okay, five is like for pros. I did four, five. I fell off the boat. And when I fell off the boat, you know what I'm saying? Uh, the, I, I, the river took me, class four. I fell out of the class four. It took me down the river. But check this out. The, the scariest part is not the surface. The scariest part is what's beneath because in these rapids, there's something called the undercurrent. And the undercurrent is like a suction cup, and it sucks you down to the bottom. And I'll never forget, when I was going down the, the and it was at the Kern River, which if you guys have heard the news, seven people have died already. Okay, so the same day that I got, that I went under, the man in the boat ahead of me died the same day that I was in there. Okay, so this is intense, guys. So I get, I get, I get sucked in the undercurrent. And it throws me, now I'm under the water. I don't know what's up, what's down, what's, I don't know anything. And then I get hit under a boulder. And I'm under a boulder now like this, and I'm like fighting. And I can remember the instructor, the master of, 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 of you know, rafting. And he said, whatever you do, never fight the current. Don't struggle with the current. You won't win it. If you fight, you'll die. And so what did I do? I fought. And I'm fighting the current, and I'm like, Ugh. and I'm trying to, and, but nothing. I just keep getting pinned more and more, and literally I can feel myself. I'm under the rock, guys. But I hear the voice of the instructor, don't fight the current. Don't fight the current. Just relax. Just chill and go with the flow of the current, and it'll let you out. It'll bring you out. So I just went. And it didn't. And next thing you know, I was like, hey, everybody, I'm back. And I literally came out of the current. Listen, you don't believe me. My, my pastor was there that day. He, he knew I was pinned. I ain't lying. It's the truth. Why do I share this with you? Because too many times when you and I are in the current of crap, when we're being buried under something, we struggle and struggle and struggle. But if you start getting with the current of God, which is called with God, what looks impossible, he will make possible and bring you back out and get you back on top and get you going to the direction that you need to be in. Amen? Get under the current of God. How do I do that? For with God. With God. No thing, nothing will be impossible. Are, are, you, are you here today? You also gave me more vacations. Come back refreshed. I needed that. How about another one? So maybe it's a fresh thing. How about Lazarus? You see, maybe right now you've been going through something and it's been years. It's been months. You see, God is a God who can change any situation at any time that you're willing to be with God. Like today, you chose to be with God today. Give yourselves a big hand clap. That's awesome. But Lazarus, Lazarus is dead for three days. So we go from freshly dead to now three days. Some of us have been for three years, two years, five years. We're dry. We're, something's happening, man. Things aren't happening. You're just stuck. You, you think that, man, it's impossible for me to change this situation. But Lazarus, he's dead for three days. The same thing, the sisters, they came and they told Jesus, Lazarus is sick, come. Guess what? He was not only distracted, but Jesus showed up for three days later. Three days later, he decides to show up. Three days. And so he shows up to the scene, and the sisters, you know what they say? If only you were here three days ago, he wouldn't be dead. How many of us have said things like that? If only, ugh, man, God, you missed the opportunity, man. If only you would have just, ugh, if you would have just given me the job, then I wouldn't be in this. And we just say all these things as if God doesn't understand time. God is time. He is time. You're not running out of time. You're running out of God. God is time. So every time you look at your watch, just think, I'm looking at God because he is my time. And he shows up and he weeps. Why? Because he knows that his time is coming. Three days he's buried, Lazarus. It reflects what's about to take place in his life. 
He's about to die a torturous death to take your sin, my sin, to take all man's sin and put it upon himself to go through the grief and the sorrow and the pain of your past, present, and future. And he knows that it's not just for one person, but it's for every single human being. 7.1 billion people on planet Earth would now be on the cross of Jesus Christ and him experiencing all the affliction of this entire world. And he's willing to do it for you and me, but he knows that it would cost him something, his life. And so he sees that the tomb has already been closed and Lazarus is there and he weeps, not because he was crying over Lazarus, but because he was weeping that there's going to be a time where he will be separated from the Father and be, be straight in hell in shades in Hades to fight the enemy, to fight Satan himself, to take the keys that have kept you and I in bondage. And then he declared on that third day our declaration of dependence of God and he opened the, the prison doors and set us free and he gave the devil a whoop down he called it and he made a spectacle of him <laughs> and Jesus looks and says Lazarus that's the call today Mauricio come forth he's calling your name today he's calling you out of your tomb today Why, why do you say it like that? Because some of you need to hear it. Come out. Wow, that's, Pastor, I thought you were going to show fireworks on the video screens. <laughs> you can watch TV for that. You know why? Because you are God's fireworks. He put the fire in you, now he wants you to work. Start doing some fireworks. <laughs> the degree of death with God does not matter. The degree of death of your family does not matter. The degree of death of your spiritual walk with God does not matter. Look at Ephesians quickly, quick. Ephesians quickly, guys. Ephesians. God is what? Let's all read this together in unison at the count of three. Ready? One, two, three. God is able to do far more than we could ever ask for or imagine. He does everything by his power that is working in us. Everything. He does it by his power working in who? Time is up. Let me just give you the last part then. We'll get out of here. Say it with me. It's never too late. Come on. It's not too late. It's not. Calm down. It's not too late. It's not too late to change. You're not too old. You're not too young. You're not too ugly. You're not too cute. It's not too late it's not it's not don't trip it's not too late just decide today stand to your feet you'll never forget this day here's what's happening with you It's almost like you've had a cardiac spiritual arrest. And you have been numb. Because life gave you a heart attack. Look at me. 
God is reviving you today. Jesus has walked into this room. What's your name? Yvonne. Yvonne. Come forth. Yvonne, come forth. He's bringing you out of your stench. He's giving you beauty for ashes today. You know what he told Jairus and his mom when the servant said, stop bothering the king. You see, you have stopped bothering God because you thought he was a bother. Jesus like, you keep coming to me. You know what he told Jairus and mom? He said, I only ask you one thing. While everybody else was hating, while everybody else was saying, it's impossible. You know what Jesus said? He said, look at me. He said, don't be afraid. Only believe. Just believe. Are you hearing me? Believe. Please just tap the shoulder of two, three people and just look at them and just say, you know what? Don't be afraid. Only believe. Please be seated. I'm reading the last scripture. Last scripture. We're done. Put your stuff away. Last scripture. I have to read this last scripture. Last scripture. I promise. Nobody moving around anymore. Nobody. Last scripture so we can get out of here. There's a story of two men, and the reason I have to share this with you is because today we have to do something quickly with you. Are your ears still attentive? Okay, good. Don't, don't, don't check out, please. The room is nice. For nine years. Everybody say nine years. See, I don't know how long you've been serving Jesus, but if you've been following Jesus for, for example, I've been following Jesus for 20 years. That means that I've been under his understudy. But God wants to take what he has shown you and now place it in your life. So there's a man by the name of Elisha and Elijah. Elisha for nine years is under an understudy of Elijah, the prophet. And he saw many great miracles through Elijah. And so Elisha was always the spectator while Elijah was the mover and shaker. Elijah comes to a place in his life where he gets a little frustrated and a little angry. And God showed grace on him and he took him home. And as Elijah was going up in the air, Elisha looked up. Elisha is now the successor of Elijah. Please listen to me. All of you must have a successor. All of you. I'm not in ministry. Yes, you are. Yes, you are. No, I'm a business person. You're a business person in ministry. I'm a money maker for the church. Great. You're a money maker in ministry for Jesus. Anything and everything you do, you do it for God. And with God. And so Elisha is looking up and he's scared. You know why? Just like most of us, we're so afraid to step out in faith because we're afraid of what people think. And Elisha looks up at his success, uh, at Elijah, his, his success. Now he's a success. He says, oh, and he's leaving. The mantle is now coming down from the wind. And so it's pretty amazing because as the mantle is coming down, it's just like, shh flying down, flying down. And as the mantle flies down, man, it falls right over Elisha. And Elisha's like, man, what do I do with this? I can't do this. I'm afraid. 
I don't have what it takes. I'm not smart enough. I'm not spiritual enough. I don't, uh. And so all these thoughts, but guess what? That's what Jesus did with you and I. When he died on the cross, he passed over his anointing to you. He's anointed you to be an awesome parent, an awesome mother, father, an awesome husband, wife, an awesome business owner, an awesome ministry person, an awesome person for God. But Elisha had a problem. Because Elisha saw many great miracles and there must have been a moment of Elisha's life where all he did was see great things in other people. But he never saw nothing great in him. And he has this burning question. Like many of us. Man, I've seen people, you know, the, why, why, why is Pastor Anthony so, like, he's amazing and he's, he's been saved shorter time than I have. Or this person's been saved for that. We look always at someone else's pasture. Not realizing that God wants you to tend yours. And so he has this question. It's like, ugh. look at the question. I think it's First Kings, guys, quickly. Second Kings, it says, then he took the mantle. Say he took the mantle. Come on, listen. You need to take your place. You need to take your faith. We'll just say faith is your mantle. You need to take your faith. Take your faith. That's your mantle. And he took the mantle of Elijah that had fallen from him. And look, and he struck the water and said, where is the Lord of Elijah? So he comes finally to a conclusion where he says, I'm tired of being tired. I'm sick of being sick. I'm tired of just being just someone who goes to church and just plays the routine, the role of Christianity. I want to see God. He says, where is the God of Elijah? And when he also had struck the water, it was divided this way and that way. And Elisha crossed over. Right now, some of you, you're in an impossible situation. Right now, things aren't opening up for you. You're stuck. You're busted. And you're just waiting for God to do something for you when God's waiting for you to do something. You're just standing there just like, okay, God's going to do it just like he did for the Israelites. You know, I'm just going to wait. No. You know what he did? He grabbed his mantle. And he had that question. And he said, where is the Lord God? Where is the God of Elijah? And you know what? I'm sure that it came to a place in his life where, you know what? Elijah had to stop just questioning God. And he had to start using his faith. And so he took the only thing that he had. And he did something with it. And he came back and he said, where? And he activated his faith. He said, where is the God of Elisha? And then... He struck the waters and he struck the waters. And what happens? Boom. It says, and then the water. We're talking about the Jordan here, guys. The Jordan went this way and that way. And then he crossed over. You need to start striking the waters again. You've gotten too comfortable. If today's message impacted you in any way, and you want to help us spread the gospel with a financial gift, text the number below, and we know that someone's life will be changed the same way that yours was today.